Franco, and this is his... I'm Mike Wallace, this is Biography. Our story, Francisco Franco of Spain. A journalist once described Franco in these words. He is a small, plump man with a little mustache and fading hair. There is nothing memorable in what he says. If it were not for the uniform, one would take him for a retired bookkeeper living on his savings. Yet Franco has dominated Spain for a quarter of a century. He is a powerful and a puzzling figure in the history of our time. Francisco Franco came to power and stayed in power through his control of the Spanish army. But for Franco, the army is not only a political weapon, it is a way of life. Says one observer, the military stands for the most urgent needs in Franco's soul, the need for absolute order, obedience, and rule by force. A man of force, he is also a man of faith. Franco calls himself chief of Spain by grace of God. Intensely religious, he prays for hours before making any major decision. But once that decision is taken, he never veers from his course. He sees himself as a man of destiny. Born in Galicia in 1892, Francisco Franco is the son of a naval paymaster. At 14, he is enrolled in a military academy, but he seems an unlikely cadet, small and frail. He graduates at 17 as a second lieutenant in the army. Now he begins to dream of glory as a soldier of Spain. 1912, eager to see action, Franco volunteers to help crush native uprisings in Spanish Morocco. This will be the beginning of one of the most meteoric careers in military history. In the fight against fierce tribesmen, Franco distinguishes himself with an almost fatalistic kind of bravery. In the face of the enemy, Franco firmly believes that he is invulnerable. Rising swiftly in rank, he becomes, at 32, the youngest general in any European army. Franco returns to Spain in the mid-1920s, a national hero. As a celebrity, he even takes a small role in a motion picture. Franco is anxious to do everything possible to increase his fame, to make of himself a man with a future among the aristocracy as well as the military. Spain now is a monarchy, but the King Alfonso is weak-willed, a mere figurehead for a dictatorial government that actually controls Spain. The Spanish people are exploited by a small but powerful ruling class. The majority of Spaniards live on the edge of starvation. Civil unrest gripped Spain. An aroused people have had enough.
With the threat of open warfare, the corrupt government quickly falls. The king flees to France. Spain is made a republic. But almost immediately, there are crises. Then, in 1936, the conflict comes to a head. A crucial election is held. The political left wing unites in a popular front. Liberals, socialists, anarchists, and communists. They decisively defeat the right wing, consisting of the army, fascists, landowners, monarchists, and the Catholic Church, which in Spain is traditionally linked to the aristocracy. With his prestige as a general, Franco now becomes a key figure in a growing plot against the Popular Front Spanish government. The right wing, dominated by fascists and reactionaries, decides that if they can't come to power in free elections, they'll do it through war. July 1936, civil war convulses Spain. It will be one of the most tragic conflicts in modern history. Two-thirds of the Spanish people remain loyal to the government in its fight against fascism. They volunteer by the thousands, but they are ill-trained and ill-equipped. These disorganized loyalists are soon infiltrated later almost dominated by Spanish communists. The Soviet Union sends them arms. Communism tries to exploit a nation's tragedy. Joining the loyalists come volunteers from foreign nations, the International Brigade. Some of them are idealists. Many of them are communists. Units from the United States call themselves the Abraham Lincoln and George Washington Brigades. Most of the Spanish army is marshaled against the Loyalists. Francisco Franco soon takes command of both the army and all phases of the revolution. Franco receives help from the outside troops and material from fascist Italy and Nazi Germany. Hitler and Mussolini grasp this opportunity for a dress rehearsal for World War II. And their aid will be a deciding factor in the revolution. The German Luftwaffe terrorizes the Spanish people by bombing defenseless cities. After long years, deep-rooted hatreds explode in violence. Both sides commit atrocities. Loyalist mobs destroy churches. Priests and nuns are murdered. The fascists stage wholesale executions in captured towns and cities. Spain's civil war is bitter, barbaric, countrymen against countrymen. Franco conducts the war with cold calculation. Says one writer, 
he turned to the world an untroubled face. Amid hatred and slaughter, he was a bandbox figure of a soldier. For more than two years, Spain will be torn by carnage. heroism is futile. They are overwhelmed by superior forces in a war that Franco regards as his personal triumph. And at the end, the proud people of Spain are left to suffer in a ravaged land. After almost three years, General Francisco Franco has won his war. He has declared El Cadillo, the leader, the dictator of all Spain. You have placed Spain in my hands, he has told the fascists. And I assure you that my hands will not tremble. Now this strange and ruthless man makes plans to bend a defeated nation to his will. Francisco Franco, the dictator of Spain, knows that he rules a hostile people. He can stay in power only with an iron hand. To the minority of Spaniards who hail him as their leader, Franco promises peace, tranquility, and he warns that all who oppose him will face the firing squads. The Spanish people have no choice. They bow to Francisco Franco. The new leader of fascist Spain meets with the dictator of Nazi Germany. Francisco Franco pledges his devotion to Adolf Hitler. I stand, he says, ready at your side, united in common destiny. Hitler tries to lure the shrewd Franco into the Second World War. Later, Hitler will say that rather than bargain with Franco again, I would prefer to have four teeth extracted. Franco also declares his devotion to Mussolini. But although Mussolini and Hitler have helped him in his war, Franco wants no real part in their war. He will give them token assistance, even a division of soldiers, but that is all. Franco has work to do in Spain itself, and he will proceed as he always does, with discipline and determination. He will create a new society in his own image. He makes the army the most powerful force in Spain under his direct control. The only political party allowed in Spain is the Falange, the fascists. Spaniards have a favorite joke. The Falange, they say, has unified all Spain in hatred of the Falange. The state joins hands with the church. 
Catholicism once again becomes the official religion of Spain with large government subsidies and control over education and censorship. There is no freedom of religion in Spain. Franco himself becomes increasingly religious. He always keeps near him an ancient religious relic said to have miraculous powers, the right hand of a Spanish saint, Teresa of Avila. But behind his back, some Spaniards say bitterly, Franco dares not trust any man. That is why he has put his trust in God. avowed enemy of capitalism clamps a fascist economy on Spain. The government controls all production, controls prices and wages, labor unions and employers. Corrupt officials, including Franco's own relatives, grow rich on a system of special privileges, influence peddling and graft. In the late 1940s, to impress the Spanish people, Franco makes gestures towards scientific and industrial progress. But to Franco, such progress is of little importance. Under fascism, the majority of the Spanish people remain virtual serfs, living in grinding poverty. scorned during this time by most of the free world, which remembers his friendship with Hitler. But he continues official relations with dignitaries of other dictatorships, like Evita Peron of Argentina. He delights in showing off the spectacle and ritual of Spain. In the early 1950s, Franco's position in world affairs changes. In the midst of the Cold War, the United States, in exchange for defense bases in Spain, offers Franco diplomatic recognition and military aid. Then, under President Eisenhower, the United States gives Franco nearly a billion dollars in military and economic aid. I've come to this nation, one of the ancestors of the Americas, with a message from the American people to the Spanish people, looking for a brighter future in cooperative labor for the noblest of all, all human causes, peace and friendship and freedom. For Franco, the money comes none too soon. His economic controls have driven Spain into bankruptcy. Franco's new relationship with the United States helps to sway world opinion. He achieves a new measure of respectability. Among other world figures who now pay state visits are Prince Renier and Princess Grace of neighboring Monaco. Franco basks in his new prestige. In the 1960s, however, Franco faces internal conflicts. The younger generation of Spain seethes with resentment against Franco and his oppressive regime.
Workers who earn a dollar a day begin to defy Franco. They break the law, risk even the death penalty, by going on strike for better pay, better living conditions. Now, dramatically, hundreds of priests of the Catholic Church openly side with the workers, with the people. They criticize Franco himself. This is a severe blow to Franco's prestige and threatens his power. Franco, however, seems confident that he can maintain his control over Spain. Proudly, he poses with his grandchildren for official newsreel cameras. He would like to be known as a benevolent despot with a strong feeling for home and family. The dictator of Spain is fond of relaxing in his palace and of watching motion pictures, especially Walt Disney cartoons. Franco, the old man of war, becomes an ardent sportsman. like a great chieftain from another age. He surrounds himself with pageantry, banners and bugles. He even makes vague promises of someday restoring the monarchy to Spain. Francisco Franco pays homage to a glorious Spain that he never knew, when Spanish armadas and armies dominated the world. Franco would like to escape the conflicts of the present. He retreats into the past. in his 70s, Franco has built his own tomb. Nothing like it has been erected since the time of the Egyptian pharaoh. It has a huge monastery and chapel. And above it all, 500 feet high, towers a cross. Few of his fellow men have honored Francisco Franco during his lifetime. He will honor himself in death. The people of Spain are haunted by the specter of another bitter civil war. Perhaps that is the crucial reason why, for a quarter of a century, they have never tried to overthrow Francisco Franco. Franco has achieved the dubious distinction of being neither loved nor hated by his people. A bitter epitaph for a man whose ambition was to be a giant. Mike Wallace for Biography. <laughs>